this morning, ooh, that's a bit hot. This morning, we are going to uh, pick back up and resume our sermon series that we have been that we started at the beginning of the year. We took a little bit off for the summer. It's in August now, um, and we are returning back to the I Believe sermon series. Now, the amazing thing for me, as as you know, when I planned out the calendar year. Obviously, during the summertime, I didn't know specifically where the Lord was going to be leading. And in the month of July, um, the Lord led us to start off right there in that very first week with the, our declaring of our independence from Satan, from uh, from ourselves, our own self-worries, uh, and, and, and saying, look, Jesus Christ is the one with whom we are going to resolutely declare our allegiance to. Um, and, then, and then from there... Uh, we, we continued on and we talked about the very next week how, uh, out of the book of James, how we can't, we can't compromise. We have to make a choice. We have to draw a line in the sand in our own personal lives and sit there and say, you know what? I, my allegiance really is with Jesus, and I'm going to stop trying to love the world and love Jesus at the exact same time. Because in my opinion, the problem and the, and, and the, the fault of churches, our church and the churches of America, is the fact that that's exactly what most Christians are doing. That they're trying to keep one foot in the church door and make everybody happy in here and act like, oh, and look how, how good we are. Let's smile and praise Jesus together. And at the exact same time, every day, Monday through Saturday, pursuing the loves of this world more than our passions for Christ. And what ends up happening is that because that's the, the lifestyle that we live, our kids grow up in con, uh, confused homes. And they say, well, mom and dad say this, but their actions say this. And so what's happened is we've raised up generation after generation for several decades now that are sitting there going, well, what is the purpose and reason? Why should I invest my life into the local church? Not realizing that you are the body of Christ. It's not these buildings. It's not these facilities. It's you. You are the body of Christ. You are what matters. Now, is your life being transformed? Because that's what we then looked at next, was the fact that the way that we no longer point ourselves to the love of the world and showing ourselves enemies to God is to have our lives literally transformed. And so we looked at that out of Romans chapter 12. Now, last week we have we were blessed with Eric uh, Sutton to share with us about the, the supremacy of the gospel, the thing that holds us to the foundations of what all even brings this transformation about. And out of that, so this whole month of July has been this progression. And now today we jump back into the I Believe series and what we're jumping right into is the process of transformation. Because today, our I believe is I believe in Bible study. In Romans chapter 12, what we said was that we're not to be conformed to this world, but be to be renewed by the transformation of our mind. What is the best way for our minds to be transformed? Through Bible study. So that is where we are going to pick up here today. And so I have us actually reading a few verses out of the book of Psalm, Psalm one nine or Psalm nineteen, excuse me, Psalm nineteen. If you uh, don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one out of your pew back, turn to the Old Testament, almost point it up into the middle. It'll be about the Psalms at that point. Turn to page three ninety nine. And if you do not have a Bible, especially in light of the fact that we're talking about Bible study, and you need a Bible, take that home with you as a gift from us today. Uh, because we think that you need to be in the Bible, especially if you're going to have your mind transformed. So turn there to Psalm 19. We're going to look at verses 7 through 14. I'm going to read all of those verses in its entirety because we're not going to hit every one of them in the exposition of this passage. But 7 through um, 14 actually bring it all together in, in, its, in its wholeness of, of this passage. So starting there in verse 7, the Bible reads this way. By the way, this is a Psalm of David. So David wrote this. And David wrote these words on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who 
can discern his errors? Acquit him, or excuse me, acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless. I shall be acquitted of great transgressions. So let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's go to the Father for a moment of prayer. Father, you really are these, these realities in our lives. You, you have given us your word so that we can be transformed by them, that in the process of spending time with you and in your word, that what we end up happening is our intimacy with you is grown. We, we start to understand the distinction between the things of this world and the things of you. And in that understanding, we start to actually have this heart's desire for the things that, that, that please your heart. And so, Father, I pray that over these next few moments, as we look at just some of the benefits of what happens as we let you transform our lives through the, through the Bible studies in our own personal lives, I pray that we really will experience the fullness of your grace, the power of your presence, the movement of you upon us this day. Father, we need to be transformed. We need renewal. We need absolute life change. We cannot, we cannot play in this world and expect for grace in you. We need to have that resolute drawing in the line of our hearts where we understand what, where our true riches lie. And it is you. Father, stir us this morning. Let your spirit move in our midst. Grow us in your grace. And empower us to be bold in our proclamation. Jesus changed the face of First Baptist Church going green. May we be a people who love you dearly and are truly committed to you because you have transformed us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. If you're taking notes this morning in your listening guide, your very first point this morning is this, is that Bible study restores your soul. Bible study restores your soul. Look, look with me at the very first part of verse 7. Verse 7 says these words. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect. Now, now understand, in this process, as we read through this, it's going to use words like law. It's going to use words like testimony. It's going to work, use words like precept. It's going to use words like commandments. Um, these words are all referencing, in, in, in one fashion or another, to this book. This book is God's word. This book is his law. This book is his precepts. This, is, this word, book is all of these kinds of things. And so when we're talking about this, Another way to read that would be the, the Bible of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. And when I read that kind of verse or that kind of phrase, it, it makes me immediately think of another part of passage of the scripture. Because he talks about this restoring of the soul. See, this is the problem with humanity. Humanity has a heart problem, a soul problem, if you will. You and I, when we are born, we are born depraved. We are born into our sinful state. You and I are sinners. You are a sinner. And if you don't come to this place where your soul is restored, if you will, if you don't come to the place where you are brought literal life, you are condemned to an eternal damnation in the lake of fire. You will spend no time with the Lord God once this life ends. So you absolutely need to come to the saving grace of a Redeemer who is found in the person of Jesus Christ, God's Son, who came to this earth, died on a cross for your sins and for my sins, that we might have a relationship with Him. The temple veil is torn so that we can have access to the Lord God. And in that process, He is the one who restores 
our soul, gives us life. And again, I'm reminded of, of Paul's words in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, where he says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It is this book. It is this book that gives us the words of life. It is this book that points us to the Savior. It is this book who, amidst all of the confusions of this world, we can point to it and say, this is true. It doesn't make a difference what the world says. It doesn't make a difference what scholars say. This is the truth. And as a result, we can hang our hats on it, if you will. We can take this to the bank and sit there and say, look, the word of Scripture is the very thing that can restore my soul because it introduces me to the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so if you're here this day and you've never encountered Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in a little bit we're going to have this time of invitation. It's where we all stand up. The, the praise team and the band will come up here and sing. And, and you can walk down the aisles, any of the aisles, and you can come down and you can say to me, you know what? I know that I know I need a Savior. I know I can't, I'm, if, I, if I died right now, I'd spend eternity in the lake of fire, separated from the grace of God, because I do not have a relationship with Jesus. If that is you, this day, then you are one who needs your soul restored. And you need to come down these aisles during that time of invitation. And I would tell you, run down these aisles. Today is the day of salvation, if you do not have that kind of relationship. And so this is the first thing that the scriptures do to us, is it points us to this Savior. But there's another thing that the Bible study does to us. Another thing the Word of God does for us as we study the Bible. It's your, it's your second point in your, in your listening guide this morning. And it's this. is that Bible study makes you wise. Bible study makes you wise. Look at the second part of verse 7. It says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple making wise the simple love well, here's the beautiful thing about the word of god is it's not about education it's not about the ability to even read the word of god by god's grace you live in in an age and time period of history where you can listen to the word of god Every day, all you got to do is pull out your phone, and you can actually listen to the Word of God. There are so many programs for your phone that it can actually read to you any document, and it can read to you the Word of God. Others of you, maybe you don't have the technological know-how to do it, but I bet you could find somebody who can read the Word of God for you if you can. This is not about education. This is about wisdom. And the Word of God gives us this Kind of wisdom. James, in our Wednesday night Bible study, we're reading through the book of James right now. And in James chapter 1, verse 5, James says it this way He says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives it to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Beloved, we live in a world where we need wisdom. In other words, a divine understanding of the right way to handle situations. And, and, I, and I want to do something even right now. Uh, it, it, again, we're going to do this kind of spur of the moment kind of stuff. But I would like right now, if you are a teacher, a, a person who assists uh, in the school system, if you, if you work in the school system, you're a bus driver, you're a maintenance worker, you're a kitchen helper. If you work in any capacity in the school system, would you please do me a favor and come down? I want to pray for you. Because school starts this week and we, you need wisdom. So if you're a teacher, an assistant, a helper, a worker in the school system, if you volunteer, if you do anything in that school system, I want you to come down because I want us to pray for you right now. Because you all need wisdom as to how to approach the gospel. In your classrooms and in your libraries, I'm looking even at a, at a principal here, administration-wise, you all need wisdom. Because we live in a world in which people say, oh, look, you can't share Jesus with these kids. You know what? That's a lie. Straight from the 
pits of hell. And I pray that if the opportunity arises, you will take the wisdom God gives you through his word as to know how to share the gospel with these kids. And, and I see Jill's on that second row. Y'all didn't leave any room for her. So, Jill, I see you, okay? So, we're, yeah, we love Jill. So I want to right now just pray for our teachers, okay? So, or and not just our teachers, but again, like I'm seeing Craig, he works in the IT department with this field. I'm seeing Christian, she's a volunteer. I'm saying these other kind of things. So if you work in any kind of capacity, I just want to pray for you right now. Richard, if you hadn't retired early, I'd have you down here too, brother, but you, you just gave up on it. You know what I'm saying? You want to come down post, 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 post Is that how it works? Yeah. Oh, he's got to be dead for that. Oh! No, we can't bring it down that way, brother. We can't bring it down that way. Let's pray for y'all. Father, I do pray right now for those that work in our school system. Lord, whether whether it's, like I'm thinking about Craig right here, whether it's in IT, where your interaction with the student body really isn't very often. But Father, if by any chance, by your grace, at any point in this particular calendar year, you open up opportunities for that for Craig, Father, fill him with power and grace to do that kind of work. Father, for these teachers, they are bombarded and told you have to teach certain sets of curriculum. And so, Father, let them do so. But at the same time, Father, let them also speak the truth. The truth of life. The truth of true power resides in you. True um, uh, saving grace resides in you. That true creation resides in you. Father, give them this biblical wisdom that your scriptures promise us that if we are actually having Bible study time, if we are actually reading your word, that it transforms us and it allows us to know how to handle any given situation in our school day. Father, we are having a generations and generations of kids. Now, this is going on now for multiple generations where they are not being taught in the schools. They are not being taught in the homes. They are not being taught anywhere the truth of life. So we have one of the highest growing humanistic, atheistic cultures rising in our world who see no value in you because they've never seen you displayed in power. So I am praying for the wisdom to fall upon these teachers so that they can live powerful lives in you and that they would bring many children to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That they would be an influence on other faculty and with whom they are teaching. That they would hear the truth of their words in, in the break rooms and in other meetings and in conference places. And as a result of hearing the truth from these, these godly men and women, that you would transform even our school systems right here in Hardy County. Father, we need to draw a line in the sand about what we teach and what we believe. And Father, I pray for your power to be upon them. Grace and mercy to give them. Wisdom. Father, we ask all of this in the precious and loving name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who through his word gives us this wisdom. We say, Amen. Teachers, thank you. You can go back to your seats. Uh, just say all that work in the school system. But thank you. Yeah, actually, you know what? If you want to give our teachers an applause, please do so. Because I'm just going to tell you, I don't have that gift mix. I'm telling you, I couldn't do what they do. My, 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 uh, I would not be allowed to teach. Uh, number three, we got to keep moving, beloved. We got to pick it up here, okay? So number three is this. So we see that Bible Bible study restores your soul. Bible study makes you wise. But we see this third point, which is this: Bible study makes your heart rejoice. Bible study makes your heart rejoice. Look at the first part of verse eight. It says, "The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing." The heart. Well, remember, this is David writing this. Now, you need to understand, this is this is actually him writing this in an earlier portion in his life. This is, this is pre-fall with Bathsheba. But we know after his fall with Bathsheba, when he cries out in Psalm 51, he says, Lord God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. This is the God in whom puts a, a joy, a rejoicing within our heart because of his word. This is, this is the kind of word that when we wake up in the morning, we're sitting there saying, I can't wait to go read this word because it penetrates my heart. It, it prepares me for the day. It does give me that wisdom. It does give me that salvation because it points me to the Savior. It does this in my life. And I am able 
in the midst of worry, in the midst of confusion, in the midst of doubt, in the midst of trials, I can say it doesn't make a difference what I'm facing. I can have a joy that resides in me. Hey, that was pretty good, beloved. You ought to do that some more often. Okay? Because that's what the Word of God ought to do within you. It ought to stir you. It ought to rejuvenate your heart. I mean, Jesus says it this way. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This is this scripture, reading it, delving into it. Learn from Jesus. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus has a way of taking all the heaviness of this world and making it light. And you're able to rejoice in him in the midst of whatever it is you're facing. And beloved, some of you are facing some serious things right now. And I want you to understand, you spend time in the word of God. You let the word of God wash over your life. And it eventually transforms you. And he turns your, your, your sorrow into joy, your mourning. Some of you are facing some serious things right now. And God's word restores us. But he does more than that. He does more than that. He also, Bible study opens your eyes. Bible study opens your eyes. Look at the next part of verse 8. The next part of verse 8 says this, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. That enlightening the eyes is another way of saying opening your eyes. In other words, the Bible helps you see things for what they really are. See, that's one of the, the things about our adversary is that he lies to you. And he uses people sometimes to lie to you. He will do anything he can to lie to you and get your eyes off of him. And yet the Lord of God is sitting here saying, look, as you spend time with the word, you're able to discern the difference between right and wrong. You're able to know the truth for what the truth really is. Um, John 8, 31 and 32, Jesus says these words. He says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. This isn't just a salvational kind of statement Jesus is making. This is a life statement Jesus is making. He, he's saying that if you are with him, if you're truly his disciple, and you're spending time with him in his word, he's opening up your eyes. And the truth of the situation sets you free. I mean, this is just, this is liberating reality. It, it, it makes me think of a, of a letter I just got. I got it actually two weeks ago, but I, but um, God knew I wasn't supposed to read it last week in light of, of Eric. And by the way, just because you send me a letter doesn't mean I'm going to read it. But I am going to read this one. The person actually asked me to read this. How I know they asked me to read it is they closed it and said, read uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. And first, uh, chapter 5, excuse me. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 27 and 28 says this. It says, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. That, that was a nice way for this person who, by the way, wrote this anonymously. If you wrote this, come talk to me. But that's their kind way of sitting there saying, hey, Please read this. So just because you write me a letter doesn't mean I'm going to read it, but I am going to read this one. This was actually dated 716. So this was a couple weeks ago. In fact, I think this was the Sunday before Eric preached here. And the person wrote these words. It says, Dear Church, Today I realize just how little I do here. I don't welcome newcomers. I don't try to make people feel welcome. And I don't try to learn your names, much less get to know you. I realize that I am friendly only to the people that are friendly to me, which some days isn't many. I don't take this personal because if everyone stopped and talked to everyone, we would never make it to the service. There are people that ask how I am doing, and a few actually care. Most of this is my fault because I don't slow down long enough for anyone to ask me how I am. And I don't want them to ask if it's fake. I have learned that just the right amount of eye contact can get a quick hello as I walk by, but too much might wind up in a conversation that I don't really want to have. I notice I have been using how are you in place of hello. So 
I'm going to stop asking that unless I really want to know. I'm asking you to do the same. I am ashamed that I have so much going on in my life that I find myself not caring about other people's lives. I have asked God to take these things from me, but I am not sure if I was ready to hand them over. How can I carry the cross and all these other things? If I am too busy to care about my fellow members of the body, what am I doing? I expect them to listen to this. Love, you ain't listening. Just stop right now. Listen to this next line that this person wrote. I expect people to care about me. However, I am not willing to do the same. Then the person wrote, wow. The letter continues, and it's why it's right here at this particular point right now. It says, we sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. And I just now told you that the word of God has a way of opening up your eyes. That you see the truth in it. And two weeks ago, somebody's eyes were opened up. And you're about to see, as I continue reading this, how their eyes were opened up. It says, we sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. And sometimes he does. But then I don't open my ears, my arms. I don't lift a finger or open my mouth. I'm not willing to show I care about you. How can I show love and compassion to the lost around me? I don't want your sympathy, but I do want you to stop acting like me. To stop doing as I do. Or maybe start doing the things that I don't do. While I'm kicking myself, I have another wow at my lack of faith. I ask God to take care of someone or something. Then I make provisions just in case God doesn't come through for me. Did y'all ever do that? Oh, God help me in this situation. Oh, but let me do this. That's what the person said. Then they asked this question, where has my faith gone? Did I ever have real faith? That was my letter to myself. I never write letters to myself. God kept bringing up my shortcomings after someone at church asked me, a fake, how are you? I wanted to be mad, but God kept turning it back on me, so I put it down on paper. I had more to say, but I felt better after writing what I had. I put my pen and paper down, picked up my Bible, and read what I had stopped this morning. I only read two verses when I got to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, which says, We ought always to give thanks to you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecution and affliction that you endure. Let me back up to this morning. Before church, I got on my knees, and I prayed like normal. Then I asked God to speak to me. I begged him. Then I sat and listened and did all I could not to think of all the stuff in my life. God didn't say a thing. So I started to get up. But then said one more time, God, speak to me. Minutes went by with no response, so I went and read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. Maybe I shouldn't say I read it because my eyes went over the words, but that was not it. I went to church and socialized just enough to stop being angry at God for not speaking to me. I didn't think about it again. Excuse me, I didn't think again about the prayer until I read those verses. Did you, did you catch all that? They actually wrote those verses. I prayed. Guidance. I didn't listen to what I read. God put it on Scott to convict us. I write a complaint about myself and the church, and then God stops me to read his word. He points out to me that I am the exact negative of those two verses, the exact negative of what he was praising the Thessalonians for, talking about Paul praising the Thessalonians. I pray that I change. That I learn to put my stuff down at his feet and trust him to handle it. That I pick up my cross for others to see. I've never felt like this. And my only explanation is that it's from God. I went back over 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 to see what I missed. And then it said, read chapter 5, verse 21. Beloved, this is somebody that God did a work on two weeks ago in our church. This is a person who, who was sitting there. And I'm now being speculative based on the things that I've just read. But this is the type of person that was sitting there going, why aren't you doing this? 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 And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit speaks to them and says, this is what Paul praises the church for. And I'm doing the exact opposite of all of it. And I'm wondering why God's not going to work in our midst. Well, I 
think that's a word for all of us, actually. You know, it's a word for me. So may we, beloved, let the Bible open up our eyes as it did for this person. May we see the truth of the situation. Truly let it set us free. There's one last point, and this is going to be quick. It says Bible study is a reward to your life. Bible study is a reward to your life. Look down, jump, jump past verse 9 and 10, jump down to verse 11. It says, Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Now, now what you need to understand is back up there in verse 10, he's telling them that, that God's word is, is, is more desirable than gold. Yes, even much, much fine gold. And he even talks about how it's even sweeter than, than honey, even the drippings of the honeycomb. The, the, this, is, this is a way of saying, look, the word of God is precious. It is a reward in and of itself. But the problem is, is that we get ourselves so wrapped up in the pursuit of the wealth of this world that we forget the wealth of God and what his word has to do for us. And he's telling us there in this 11th verse that his word, in keeping them, there is great reward to your heart. This makes me think of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter uh, 6, verses 19 through 21, when he says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Beloved, we need to have our treasure wrapped up in the things of God. 